Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> um, if you haven't had a chance to say good evening to someone to your right or to your left, I want to give you permission just to do that very quickly. Uh, welcome, welcome. So glad you're here. All right. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, it's hard to believe that this week-long seminar is already wrapping up. This is actually the concluding weekend of Ty's seminar. How many of you have been blessed by the studies night by night? Amen, amen. And maybe some of you are here for the very first time. Don't worry, you will be blessed too. Um, we wanted to make a few things known as we get started here tonight. Uh, just a quick announcement, just kind of a housekeeping thing. If you could, everybody, just uh, grab your cell phone very quickly. I'm going to do the same thing, actually. I had an alarm go off in a meeting. Um, go ahead and just turn your phone to silent or vibrate for us. That would be helpful. Um, another thing we wanted to mention to you is that tonight is actually the last 7 o'clock meeting. Okay? Did everybody hear that? Tonight is actually the last 7 o'clock meeting of the, of the See With New Eyes seminar. But tomorrow, I wanted to announce the schedule for tomorrow. In case you're taking notes, there is a 10 o'clock Bible study that takes place here every Saturday morning, every Sabbath morning here at the Franktown Church. And then there's an 11.15 worship hour, and Ty is actually going to be presenting for that worship hour at 11.15. There will be an awesome fellowship lunch that everyone is invited to here in the fellowship hall, and that's going to be right after the main worship hour, and then 2 o'clock will be the last presentation of Ty's. So just want to make sure that everybody is aware of that. 10 o'clock, there's a Bible study here followed by an 11.15 presentation by Ty, and then fellowship lunch where everybody's involved or invited, and then 2 o'clock where uh, Ty will conclude the seminar. All right, so just wanted to make those things clear. And, uh, um, you know, the reality is that, uh, you know, just, just a few minutes ago here in the back office, I was realizing, wow, this, I wasn't quite prepared for the seminar to be done. You know, there's, there's usually this time for me, you know, when, I, when I've been coming to a seminar night by night, I've been so enthused, and maybe the better word is revived by a night by night study. How many of you have been revived by the night by night study? Yeah. And the reality is that sometimes we, we come to the end of an experience like that, we have these mountaintop experiences, and we kind of wonder what's going to happen after that. You know, the preacher is uh, going on to another uh, locale, or, you know, maybe the, the rhythm is going to be changed. It's going to be life as usual. And I just want to encourage you today that if you've been blessed and enthused and revived by these night-by-night -night studies, the reality is that we can have that experience every time we open God's Word. Amen. It's not that, I mean, Ty is a great preacher. Let, let's not get that wrong. Uh, Jamie's a great preacher. Let's not get that wrong. But really, it's the word of God that has power. Amen. And in Romans 10, 17, it says, Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of Christ. Amen. And so every time you are seeking faith to grow in your heart, every time you're seeking for revival day by day, hey, just take some time with Jesus in his word. And so tonight we are so excited for the, another opportunity to be led in a study of God's word. Before we do, I'm going to ask Jamie to pray for us. Let's bow our heads as we get started. Good evening, Father. It's good to be here together as a group to study your word. And Lord, we petition you tonight to be here in our midst, to sit by our sides, and to give us clarity of mind as we open the scriptures. Lord, um, help the distractions that we've had throughout the week that maybe have, have been on the forefront of our minds to, to just be put on the back burner for now so that we can just enjoy your presence, enjoy a good Bible study, and, uh, and enjoy the beginning of your Sabbath. Lord, uh, be with Ty as he begins to break the bread with us today and to open the word and uh, give him clarity as he explains the beautiful things that you've uh, given us in Scripture. Lord, we thank you so much for the time we've had together each night in the Bible studies and we ask that, that these, these things that we've learned stick with us and inspire us as we continue in our journey with you. Bless us tonight as we open your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, here we go. We're on the home stretch. <clears throat> so glad you're here. Want to make sure that you have the appropriate outline. If you do not have the outline called Family of God, would you raise your hand right now? Just want to make sure everybody has one. This, for those of you who have not been here with us, this is uh, both a record of the basic material that we've been covering, but more importantly, this is a note-taking device so that you can have a record 
of the aha moments that God communicates to your heart and mind above and beyond and apart from anything I might try to communicate, I believe that the Holy Spirit is going to be present to communicate with you specifically. So get your pen ready and uh, take some notes. I really want to encourage you to do that. I don't know if you've ever had an experience like this before, but I was uh, with about 15 of my friends one time in the city of Zalata Ust in the Ural Mountain Range. And there was a building that we rented in order to hold some meetings like these. And there were a few hundred people attending each evening, so it was quite a, quite a crowd to navigate, but each evening, the same basic thing would take place. We would all exit the big theater into this beautiful, ornate, old foyer, and we would just stand around visiting, just talking, just little groups here and there. You could just hear the laughter, people smiling, laughing, talking, chattering for another 30 minutes or an hour afterwards, like we're doing here. But on this particular evening, I think just two nights into the series, I'm standing there in the foyer having a conversation with about four people. And I don't know if you've ever had this feeling where you don't see somebody looking at you, but you have the feeling that somebody's looking at you. Have you ever had that experience? And so I'm thinking, ah, oh, that's weird. And so I just casually, as we're talking, I just kind of turn my head and I glance this way. And sure enough, on the far wall, bobbing her head between all the heads of the people, there's a woman against the wall and she's just looking through the crowd to the group that I'm talking with. And as soon as I turned her away, we just had just brief, like nanosecond of eye contact and she quickly turned away and just looked down and acted like, no, 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 I wasn't staring because of course that's weird. And then I resumed conversing with a few people. I, knew out of my peripheral vision now she's staring our direction again so I sped up my my transition I went like that but she was faster than me <laughs> and she quickly turned down and she just she just acted like no big deal I wasn't I wasn't staring because of course that's weird and uh, and so then I resumed conversing with the people again and this time I was I must say I was lightning fast and I just acted all casual. I was talking just like that. And there she was. And I looked at her and I gave her, you know how you can communicate with your eyes? I said to her without words, with my eyes, I caught you. <laughs> you are looking and this time you're busted. And I just held her without blinking, with eye contact and began moving through the crowd toward her. Just in between the various people until I was face to face with this woman. I said, hey, I'm so glad you're coming. Is there anything that you have on your mind, questions you might have about the subject matter that we're covering? And I went to shake her hand and she kind of pulled back so I squeezed her shoulder a little bit. And she flinched and pulled back and actually went against the wall. And I thought, oh, that's strange. She must have a torn rotator cuff. That was just the first thing that came to my mind. So I said as much to her. I said, you must have an injured shoulder. I'm really sorry. She said, no, no, it wasn't, it wasn't that. It wasn't pain. And then she looked away again. The woman could not maintain eye contact. She was so nervous, so self-conscious, that I was beginning to feel nervous and self-conscious. And she said, no, it's, it's just that nobody's touched me for 12 years. Those are the words that I heard come out of the mouth of one of our fellow human beings. Nobody has touched me in 12 years. Oh, the pain that pierced through my heart in that moment. And I thought to myself, nobody's touched you in 12 years? Years, and then I just got this flash of insight. I said to myself, this woman needs to be kissed. So I grabbed her in my arms, and I took her low, and I planted one on her. <laughs> and as I pulled her back up, she looked into my eyes, and she said, y you like me, don't you? And I said, yes, I do like you, but I am married. Don't get any ideas. And she laughed, and I laughed as I stood there with what appeared to me to be a woman who was in 
probably her 80s. I said to her, 12 years, and you haven't been touched. She said, my husband died 12 years ago. And since then, I've been alone in my flat. That's what they call it over there, an apartment. And she said, no, I've just, I'm alone. And then I heard about these meetings, and so I came. And so I quickly motioned for my friends to come who were in the distance watching, thinking, what are you doing kissing that lady? <laughs> and I said, come on over here. And they came, like, like nine or ten of the 15 that were with me, they came, and, and I, said, I said, this is my new friend, and I introduced her, and they began talking and laughing. She began to laugh and to talk. And this is a woman who, when I first saw her, her entire body language communicated loneliness and pain. She was, she was not in the least comfortable even having the slightest contact with another human being. There are hundreds of people and she is standing alone by a far wall. But I had obviously said something in one of the presentations that made her begin to wonder that maybe, just maybe, there might be some hope for me to connect with some other humans. But she didn't have the courage to do it. So she just stood there looking, hoping. And I watched her, kid you not, I watched that woman over the next two weeks come early each evening just so she could say hi, and interact with all of her new friends. I watched her begin to dress differently. Her hair suddenly looked fabulous, not to say that it wasn't. Well, it wasn't. It was bad the first time. She didn't care. She didn't care. And suddenly she cared. Are you tracking with me? Her posture became more erect. She could have eye contact with me immediately. She started telling me Russian jokes that I didn't understand. She became my friend, and she became the friend of my friends. And literally, I watched this woman change before my eyes. She opened like a flower opens to the sun in a matter of a couple weeks. So that when we had to finally leave and get on the airplane and fly home, there were tears in her eyes because her friends from across the world were leaving. But we made sure that she had other friends before we left. Now, my question for you, my question for us this evening, is a really simple one. I like simple questions and simple answers. Here's the question. Why are we like this as human beings? Do you hear the question? Why are we as human beings so utterly, completely dependent on interaction with others? Why is it so contrary to our natures to go it solo, even if I happen to be an introvert, and I am an introvert? Social contact isn't just for the extroverts among us. Why is it that we're like this as human beings? I'm going to suggest to you that, yes, we are biological creatures. We all have a physical body. But that biology, that physical body that we all have, is equipped with all kinds of internal mechanisms, mentally, emotionally, and socially, so that even our physical health is dependent on social integration because we're not merely biological creatures. We have bodies, but we also have minds. We're mental creatures. We think thoughts. We have thought patterns. But not only are we mental creatures, we're emotional creatures. Our thoughts produce feelings. We emote as human beings. We feel things. Tears form in our eyes. Smiles come to our lips. We jump up and down for joy sometimes. We spontaneously lift our hearts in song 
to sing. I read something by a philosopher years ago who was an atheist, and he was struggling with how to wrap his mind around theism or the belief in the existence of God. And so he worked through all the arguments for the existence of God, the ontological argument and the teleological argument and the cosmological argument and all of this high-sounding philosophical deductive reasoning. And none of those lines of argument, none of those lines of intellectual processing persuaded him that God exists. And then he finally came to the conclusion that he does believe in God, and here's why. He said, if the only evidence I had was music, I would be compelled to believe in the existence of God. If music alone was the only evidence on the table, the fact that we sing the fact that a human being formulates a melody and then composes words to go with the melody, melody to express love and adoration and to speak words from the heart to draw others. The fact that we sing, he said, that we are these emotional creatures is evidence enough for me, he said, that God exists. So we're not just emotional creatures, we're also social creatures. We write songs because there's somebody we're writing about, or two, and we want them to hear what it is that we have to express in our emotional outbursts of love in song and art. We're social creatures. We're social creatures, and here's the punchline. Here's the top line, if you will, of what we are as human beings. The reason why we're social is because we're spiritual. You are a fundamentally spiritual creature inhabiting a physical realm. You are not fundamentally a physical creature inhabiting a spiritual realm. The thing that is most basic about you is that you were made in the image of God to love like God loves. And that's why your heart longs for relationships of integrity and trust and loyalty, friendship, depth. You long for that kind of thing more than you want anything else. And the reason you long for it is because you were made in the image of God. Now, now the popular notion that is gaining popularity in our world is that, that you and I as human beings, that you, are merely, that you are merely a bipedal consumption and reproduction machine. That's it. You're an animal on two feet that reproduces and eats. And you're going to die, and that's the end of it. There's no narrative, there's no story, there's nothing more to you than your animal urges for reproduction and consumption. But what I'm going to suggest to you this evening is you are something far more dignified and lofty and astounding than that. You are a creature of the divine image and you will never be perfectly satisfied with anything less than being loved and reaching out of yourself to love others. That's what you are as a human being. That's what I am. And because of that, God has done something ingenious. And here's the ingenious thing that he's done. He has created what I'm going to refer to as, as a fellowship of community and joy. A fellowship of community and joy. Now, the scripture that we're about to read in 1 John chapter 1 is the Apostle John, who began following Jesus when he was about 17 or 18 years old. He is somebody who knew Jesus intimately. The Bible says of him, actually it's him speaking of himself when he writes this, he speaks of himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. That was his moniker. That's how he wanted to be identified. I mean, it probably drove the other disciples crazy, him referring to himself like that all the time. There's Peter, there's James, and there's the one Jesus loves. That's me. But John, the one Jesus loved, knew the heart and mind of the Savior. And he describes in language that is so provocative and so engaging the reason why Jesus came to the world. This is the whole deal right here. He says, 
in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard with our ears, that is, which we have seen with our eyes, and have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, and then there's an M dash. Just pause right there. This is all language that he's using to describe his encounter with Jesus. He's essentially saying, I saw God in the flesh, I heard him talk, I saw him with my own eyes, I actually touched the Almighty in the flesh. That's what he's saying in this first verse. That which was from the beginning, that which we have seen, heard, touched, handled, God in the flesh. Now watch this. The life, again speaking of Jesus, was manifested. Pause right there. The word that he uses for life here is a very popular girl's name right now in the United States. It's the word zoe, Z-O-E, as opposed to bio-life or bio-life, B-I-O, from which we get words like biology, biological. We all have biological life, don't we? We all have bodies. And that biological life that we have, if we're not careful, will be the extent to which we define ourselves. We are in danger of allowing popular science to define us as merely biological creatures, just animals. But here, Scripture says that Jesus brought something to the world. He brought a quality of life to the world, a certain kind of life called zoe life. In English, we just have one word. We're kind of handicapped with this word life. We just have the word life. There, there's nowhere else I can go in order to make my point. But if I go into the Greek, I, I'm a little bit more lucid in my ability to move between concepts because in Greek thinking, there's two kinds of life. There's zoe life and bio life. There's biological existence, and then there is a higher quality of life called zoe. It is a quality of life that is defined by receiving and giving love. It's spiritual life. And so John says, hey, we actually encountered. We saw him, we heard him, I actually touched him. And who is he? The life. The life. I should have capitalized the word life in this slide just to make the point. Jesus is the life. Jesus is life the way life is meant to be. Jesus has put on display before us what it really looks like to be alive. Jesus is the life, he says, and this is fascinating. John says the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father, are you tracking with his chronology here? Okay, Jesus was incarnate. You hear the word carne there. He became flesh. Jesus was incarnate. He came to the world, but what is he telling us here? What is John telling us here? Well, before he came here, he was where? He was with the Father. That's where he was. On a previous evening, we saw where Jesus in John chapter 1, verses 18 and 19 said, stating his point of origin, you remember? He said, just so you know where I came from, I mean, I'm here now on earth, but so you know my point of origin, I came from the bosom of the Father. That is to say, metaphorically, symbolically, poetically, I came from the heart of the Father, from intimacy with the Father. I came out of this blissful friendship with the Father into the world now to draw you into that blissful friendship. So here Jesus is in the world, and he's putting on display, according to John, he's putting on display the life. The life. The life that you and I were meant to live all along. And Jesus manifested this eternal life, and he, this life, was with the Father, and then he came to this world, and he was manifested to us, and there he is. Wow, so beautiful. Taking little children up into his arms, blessing them, forgiving the woman caught in the act of adultery, socializing with people who were outcasts from society and on the margins that nobody was allowed to touch or to speak to and 
Jesus was constantly just going into their presence and making friends with them. Even the, the greatest riffraff criminals of the society, the IRS agents, one of them called Zacchaeus, that nobody would associate with, went up into a tree to keep himself apart because if he came down and got close, everybody else would just part ways because nobody wanted to even be in this man's presence because he was, in fact, he was, in fact, using the system for his own financial aggrandizement on the backs of people who couldn't afford to pay the taxes that he was leveling against them, levying against them. So he climbed up in a tree just to get a glance of Jesus, and Jesus, right in front of everybody, said to Zacchaeus, the tax collector, the thief, the dregs of society, hey, Zacchaeus, come on down. I want to have lunch with you at your house. The life was manifested this beautiful life of love and acceptance, this beautiful life of forgiveness, this beautiful life of social integration. The life was manifested, and we saw him, and then check this out. Here's the point. That which we have seen and heard, Jesus, in other words, we declare to you. That, now pay attention to the grammar here, that, in your outline, circle the word that, in order that, so that. The whole reason we're preaching the gospel to you, John says, the whole reason I'm writing what I'm writing to you, the whole point of this is that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. This is mind-blowing. Do you hear what he's saying? John is saying... We, apostles, have been brought into intimate fellowship with the God of the universe. And the whole reason we're preaching the gospel is to integrate you into that circle. The gospel is the process of socializing people into the family of God. It, it, the gospel is not preached in order to merely correct people's false doctrines, to make sure everybody has the right intellectual way of articulating beliefs. Truth is vital, but truth has an end in sight, an end goal. The whole point, according to this scripture, the whole point of the proclamation of the gospel, the whole reason we've been doing what we're doing night by night here, isn't just to fill our heads full of facts and data. We didn't, we didn't do these meetings in order to just satisfy our curiosity for interesting things. The whole point of this, and John's whole point is, hey, the reason we're doing what we do is in order to pull you back in to the most beautiful relationship imaginable. To pull you into fellowship with the Father and with His Son and with us. The word fellowship here is koinonia. Everybody say koinonia. Koinonia, like coin, like a coin, like a quarter. Koinonia. And the word literally means community. It means communion, as in two or more individuals getting to know one another. It, it means participation. The word means, and this is the best definition of the word, the most understandable definition of the word, koinonia is shared life. It's shared zoe life. It's a way of being that is socially integrated. It's a way of being that involves building relationships of trust and loyalty and affection as a reflection of the triune God. God is love, social love. God is a community, Father, Son, and Spirit. God is outgoing, other-centered love in a constant, perpetual motion 
of giving and receiving, giving and receiving, giving and receiving. God is love. We were made in God's image. We lost that image. And the gospel and the church exist for the purpose of re-inducting human beings into the society of the Trinity, into fellowship with the God of the universe, to share life with fellow human beings who are all collectively sharing life with God through Jesus Christ. So then in verse 4, John says this. He says, and these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Okay, so track with John's process here. He says, I encountered God in the flesh and it was awesome. The whole reason I'm preaching, teaching, and writing these things is so that you can also have the same kind of fellowship with God that I'm telling you I had. And when you get in to that fellowship, I'm telling you, he says, your joy is going to go off the charts. The whole reason I'm telling you this is so that your joy may be full. The word joy here is such a great, such a wonderful Greek word. And it literally means, kara means delight, pleasure, happiness, and my favorite, to feel emotionally alive. This is so amazing. We have this horrible picture of what church is because so often I guess we've made it other than what it's supposed to be. The church is not, the church is not a building in a local community. The building is where the church gathers from time to time. But the church is composed of actual living, breathing human beings. They could literally, all of them collectively, get up and go under a tree, and the church would then be under the tree, not in the building. Are you tracking with me? So the church isn't the thing with the address on the street corner. The church is the fellowship that occurs from time to time within that building. And the whole point of church life is to increase our joy quotient. So our joy can be full. So the church is not merely a community of fellowship and joy, it's necessarily a community of love and healing. Now, this is what the Bible teaches. I'm not, these aren't my, my ideas. I'm not conjuring this up in order to, to tell you some personal opinions I have. This is the way the biblical narrative describes what the church is. We just saw that the church is a community of fellowship and joy, but notice that the church is a community of love and healing. This is in Acts chapter 2, verses 40 through 47. And with many other words, he, that's Peter, I believe, in the context here. Yes, Peter testified and exhorted them, saying, so, so Peter's preaching something, okay? And what, what, what was he preaching? He said, be saved from this perverse generation. The word perverse, uh, it sounds like he's just doing kind of a, kind of a, a name-calling extreme Peter on us here. Well, he is Peter after all, so he might just be calling names here a little bit. But the word perverse just means wrong use. I mean, a perverse use of a glove would be to put it on your foot. Yes or no? Yeah. And a perverse use of a shoe would be to put it on your hand. So there's a sense in which the world in which we live is one massive collection of perversions or misuses of the material world, misuses even of relationships. Misuse is what is meant here. So he says, be saved from all of this misuse. Be saved from everything going cattywampus and off kilter and off script. Be saved from from this world around us that is trying to reconfigure reality contrary to reality. Do you understand what I'm saying? He says, be saved from all of that. Be saved 
from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to the church. So I'm emphasizing here the word saved and baptized. On a previous e evening, I brought to your attention the word saved in another passage of Scripture. It's a very beautiful Greek word, sozo. And it is the word at the time of Jesus and the apostles that is the common medical term that is used for physicians and the work they do. Jesus, by no accident, was called the great what? Do you know? The great physician. And so as the great physician, he brought salvation. That is, he brought sozo. Sozo means, the word means to heal, it means to restore, it means to make whole, it means to deliver or to liberate from whatever ails you. What, whatever it is that's weighing you down, whatever it is that has your life going sideways, whatever it is that has you just under the boot of life, your neck crushed down and there's no way to escape, whatever it is, mentally, emotionally, physically, socially, whatever's going on with your family, your marriage, your kids, whatever's going on in your relationships at work, whatever's going on with your finances, whatever's going on, whatever's going on, whatever's going on, it's all bonkers in this world's system, and Jesus came to put everything right. Jesus came to heal, to liberate to deliver, to make whole, to put everything back together the way it's supposed to operate. How is a marriage supposed to be? Jesus has the wisdom, the light, the grace to make your marriage everything you desire it to be, everything it ought to be. What are parent-child relationships supposed to be like? Not the misuse, not the perverse way, but the right use. What do, what are family units supposed to look like? How are they supposed to operate? Well, Jesus comes to the world with the light, the wisdom, the perspective, the healing, the grace, the forgiveness for past failures that gives you the ability to make your family everything it's supposed to be. Jesus literally, with no exaggeration, is the life. He's the answer. He's not one answer in a list. Jesus is the Savior of the world, the healer, and he's got what you need, whatever it is that you need. A little bit of a testimony at this point. This came to my mind. I often tell myself that the thing I'm most thankful for is that God got a hold of my heart when I was 18 years old, when I was a teenager. Because the trajectory of my life, the decisions I was making, the things I was doing, the way I was navigating relationships, the way I was doing life, if I would have continued on that trajectory until I was 30 or 40 or 50, what I'm saying to you is, if you're young, don't wait. This world has nothing to offer you that can't be made better or betterer or betterist, if you put Jesus at the center of your life from the get-go, from the beginning. I'm speaking specifically to young people right now, especially two of them that are whispering, and what I want them to hear is that Jesus is the answer. At the youngest stage of your life as a human being, put Jesus in the middle of all of it, and everything, everything will be bettered by the presence of Jesus in your life. Sozo, healing, to be made whole, to be restored. We so vitally need to understand that we as human beings are fundamentally broken. We are busted at the deepest possible level as human beings. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 5 and 6 says it this way, Why should you be stricken again? you will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faints. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed up or bound up 
or soothed with ointment. This is all, this is all language of physical illness and physical healing. But it's all a metaphor, it's all symbolic for the deeper spiritual healing that we all need. We're not all necessarily sick and covered with wounds and bruises and putrefying sores physically. Our bio life is oftentimes just fine. But on the Zoe level, we are full of wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. We are, quite frankly, the scripture says, we are sick in the head. We are mental, every one of us. You look in the mirror in the morning, you're looking in the eyes of a crazy person. Only by the grace of God are you not just tipping off the edge into some dark abyss of obsession or addiction or relational disintegration. You are in need of a savior. I am in need of a savior. The scripture says we're wounded from head to toe. We sustain at least two kinds of wounds as human beings. There's not a person in the room tonight who is not wounded in these two ways. We, all of us, have in our emotions, in our hearts, we have violation wounds. Things have been done to you that should have never been done to you, beginning even as a child. Things have been done to you and me that should have never been done. You were spoken to in ways you should have never been spoken to, you heard angry tones that you should have never heard with your sensitive little boy ears. You were touched in ways that you should have never been touched. Anger, violence, you experience things that you should have never experienced. You're not wired for it. We were made in the image of God, and that means that the fine mechanisms of our emotions are such that we were only supposed to ever experience kindness and love and gentleness. A human being isn't even psychologically wired to hear raised voices in anger, let alone being slapped across the face or shouted at. You're not even capable of processing somebody speaking ill of you behind your back and then discovering it. You don't know what to do with it. You don't know how to process it. It hurts. You're not wired for disloyalty. When somebody claims to be your friend and then they're not, you have nowhere to put that. It just gouges your insides out. It hurts you because you're not wired for it. You were made in the image of God. You are, by nature, very sensitive. You can only endure the hardness that you encounter in this life by gradually becoming hard yourself or by finding a love that transcends that hardness that can return sensitivity to you. But that's just violation wounds. We've all been violated. We've all, we've all been treated in ways we should have never been treated and we carry wounds in our deep subconscious that come out in our behaviors and our attitudes. But we all also carry what I'm going to call vacancy wounds. If violation wounds are things that were done to you that ought not to have been done to you, vacancy wounds are things that should have been done for you and never were, like an absent father or a present mother who was not emotionally tuned in or living life in such a way that you were finally put in school and all the kids were repelled by you and nobody would talk to you or be your friend. There was a vacancy. You're only made for relationships that are good and positive and true. And so there are some things that you, you needed and you never got it. For me, that would be the father figure. I, to this day, I have, my father's name is on my birth certificate. Right there, Jonathan Gibson. That's his name. I've never laid eyes on him except for in one little photo. I don't know who he is. He is likely, if you do the math, probably still alive. 
He probably lives somewhere in California or Arizona for all I know. I've never met him. I don't know who he is. I was supposed to have a father. I didn't. It's only by integrating with God the Father and the church that that's been able, that void's been able to be filled inside of me. I'm using myself as an example, asking you to be introspective about your own vacancy wounds. You've been violated, and there are things that ought to have been done for you that were never done for you, and you're broken. You're in need of healing and restoration and liberation. And Jesus is the Savior, the healer, that is. He's the one who brings sozo to the world. He's the one that brings sozo. Well, how does he do it? The scripture goes on in Acts chapter 2 and says, and they, that is the, 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 the body of believers, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, that's not a word we love anymore, the word doctrine. Who wants doctrine? Well, I'm kind of weird because I do. I really love it. But you'll like the word as soon as I tell you what it means. If you don't like the word doctrine, you're about to like it. Okay, get ready. Are you ready to like the word? The word doctrine just means, very simply, beautiful knowledge. Don't you want some beautiful knowledge? Don't you want to know things that are just mind-blowingly beautiful? Don't you want to see things you've never seen before that will just put you out of breath because it's so astounding? Okay, that's doctrine. Doctrine, when rightly understood and communicated, is the beauty of God's character packaged in ideas, concepts, so they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. And what's that word again, as we learned earlier? Koinonia. And what does it mean? It means to be brought in to fellowship, community, communion with others around this beautiful knowledge. There's, there's something extremely satisfying about corporate discovery where, where two or three or four or a hundred people get together and say, oh my goodness, it's like that? That's the truth? God's that good? It's that beautiful? And we share in fellowship those aha moments. There's something incredible about it. Fellowship. And they also continued not only in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, but in what? breaking bread. That just means they went out to dinner a lot together. They invited one another over to one another's homes. Hey, come over. I don't even have, it's not even that good. I ruined this dish. It's lame. It doesn't even taste good, but that's not the point. The point is fellowship. So come over and eat my lame pizza with me that I just experimented on. The church are people who get together they integrate, they fellowship, they eat together. From a biblical standpoint, eating food is not about caloric intake. In fact, there's a beautiful scripture that says that Jesus, that God came to the world, that Jesus came to the world to save us, and you know how he did it? Here's the words in scripture. It says, he came, God came from heaven to earth. He came eating and drinking. He came eating and drinking. Was he hungry up there? had to come down here to eat? From a biblical standpoint, eating is not about caloric intake. It's about eye contact across the table. It's about laughter. It's about, hey, how are you doing? What's going on? It's about two buddies getting together in the middle of the day in their lunch hour and saying, so how's it going with your marriage? Is there anything I can do? Is there something I can pray for you about? I know it wasn't going well last week. Are you finding the tools and the resources to, to solve the problem? It's about fellowship. It's about fellowship, breaking bread. And then it says this. This is, this is amazing. Then awe came upon every soul. And many wondered, many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. The whole community, everyone around them that aren't a part of the church are looking at the church and saying, 
That's amazing. Look at how these people love each other. Look at, look at the fellowship that they have with one. This is amazing. The community around. It's not just our witness as a church isn't merely to put out brochures like we have, which is a good thing to do, and invite people to um, hear some lectures. That's cool. That's not what it's all about, though. The church needs to be the kind of people that the world around looks on and says, man, I got to get, get myself in on that. They're having a great time. These people love each other. These people have fellowship. When somebody fails in their community, they surround that person and uphold them and, and they help them heal. They don't judge them and condemn them and push them out. If you, if you blow it in the church, you're loved. The world needs to see that. The world needs to say, man, when you start to fall apart, you need to be in church because those people will love you back into healing and health. Wow, it's an amazing thing. Now, all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. In other words, they paid attention to the needs in their community. And they made sure that nobody was suffering and hurting. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity. I, I don't know what it is. Could you all hear that or was I just... I thought there was just this Colorado gale force wind coming from the back or something. Uh, that's telling me how, no, take it away. I, that's telling me how long I'm preaching. So now I don't have to pay attention to that. I can go as long as I want. Sure, take it away. Yeah, it's not that. I preach with that all over the world and it's on airplane mode. So that's not causing it. So this is amazing, isn't it? I want you to notice one last thing in this passage. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. Let yourself just be blown away by this. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. I'm going to tell you something right now. It's going to sting a little bit, but I have to say it. If your church, whether it's, whether it's this one, and I love this church. I've been here a gazillion times. This is, this is like my extended church almost. I've been here so many times. I love this church. The same is true of my local church where I pastor in Eugene. doesn't matter what church. If your church is not attracting people from the community, you're not doing it right. According to this scripture, if church is done the way church is supposed to be done, are you tracking with me? The people around are in awe and the church has the favor of the unbelieving community. They're like, whoa, these people are pretty amazing. We, we want to interact with them. That's what the basic feel is that is coming out of the church. And the, and, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And what's that word saved again? Healed or made whole. So the church is growing. Why is it growing? Is it growing merely because of brochures and preaching? Come on, tell me the truth. I'm the one doing the preaching. You can't hurt my feelings. Is the church growing just because of brochures and preaching? No. Why is the church growing in this passage? Because those people love each other. That's why the church is growing. And the community around them knows it somehow. And they're attracted to the church. The church, the word that we just read in that passage, church, is ecclesia, ecclesia. And the word literally means called out, named out. Notice the word out, identified and defined. But here's the thing about the church. Here's the thing about the church. The church is not called out for the sake of being out. The church is called out to go in. The church is not a separatist movement. The church, according to what we've read so far, is, is fundamentally social, and not just with the church's own people. The church is called out to go in. The church is called out to be what Jesus called a light on a hill. The church is called out to be salt, scattered 
around to make things taste better. Every local church needs to ask himself, well, our presence in this community, does it make the world and life and the quality of life taste better to those who aren't even members of our community? Are people like, man, oh, if that church ever closed down, this community would be sad. Or if your church closed down, would nobody even notice? And be like, oh, great, more real estate to sell. Is the church just occupying space and sucking oxygen and using resources? Or is the church adding value to the world around it like salt and light? And somebody is inevitably at this point going to say, but the church is full of hypocrites and gossips and judgmental meanies. Well, so if you join, there'll be one more. <laughs> How convenient. Misery loves company. Like attracts like. That's not what I meant to say. I take all that back. No, I don't. That's all true. But I have something else to say. This is something that we are all inclined to say. There is no doubt if you get in close proximity with other human beings, somebody's going to rub you the wrong way. It's just the fact of the matter. The church does have hypocrites. It does have gossips. And it does have meanies. There's no doubt about it. But I want to tell you something. You need precisely that. And I'll tell you why. Because you need to give and receive forgiveness in order to really grow as a human being. You need to struggle through per per personality differences with others. If you want to remain a social and moral weakling, if you want your human development to be stunted, stay home alone and watch 3ABN and eat Pringles. But if you want to really grow as a human being, you've got to come in to the company of others and take the risk that somebody's going to hurt you. You need to struggle through personality conflicts and differences with others just to grow as a human being. You need to remain committed to people when they annoy you and fail you. You need that as a human being. I need that. In fact, I'll say it this strong. I believe this with all my heart. This may be the last time I'm ever, ever coming here, but that's all right. The fastest way to mature as a human being is to remain committed to people who fail you. If you keep walking away from people, you'll never grow. I know people who do what's called church hopping. They just go here or wherever the best speaker is or wherever the best potluck is or the potluck one, that's not bad. I don't mind following, especially if there's, well, here's the thing. The church is not a spectator event once a week to attend where the best show is put on. That's not what the church is. The church is a community of people who are committed to one another and they remain committed to one another even when they annoy one another and cross one another and fail one another and the process of loving people and continuing to love them and then, oh no, here she goes again. I can't believe how annoying she is and keep loving her. Keep loving him. He's going to grate on your nerves because it takes one to know one. The fact is that you need fellowship with people who rub you the wrong way because every time somebody annoys you, it is revelatory of something in yourself that needs healing. So the church is a social unit in which our violations are forgiven and healed. The church is an incubator for growing new humans that love like God loves. The church is a climate in which... A combination of elements are applied to facilitate mental, emotional, and relational growth. The church is a community in which the vertical relationship of individuals with God bleeds over into the horizontal relationships that people have with one another. 
That's what the church is. And the church, as that kind of community, is an agent of proclamation at that point. In other words, when we're a part of that fellowship, that koinonia, when we're a part of that growing, thriving group, not a growing, thriving group in which there are not faults and failures and mistakes, a growing, thriving group in which there's a whole lot of forgiveness, that kind of group. When that's going on and the favor and awe of the community around is paying attention, then we have something to say out of the credibility of the life we're living. Do you understand what I'm saying? Credibility. The reason Jesus was so effective is because he loved people and they knew it. So when he preached, they were inclined to listen to what he had to say. He had change in his pocket relationally with them. They knew he was authentic. They knew he was the real deal. Somebody forgives you? Somebody keeps loving you even when you're obnoxious and you know it? And then that person stands up to preach or sits down with you at a table to have a Bible study and you're all ears because the way they treated you gave them credibility in your mind. So the church is an agent of proclamation. Jesus, through Peter, communicated this idea. You, the church, you're a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The church is an agent of proclamation, but notice what it is that we're proclaiming. The church is proclaiming the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into light. In other words, the message of the church, the message the church is called to proclaim is the beauty of God's character of self-giving love as revealed in Christ. And the church, in its proclamation, is giving to the world a new narrative. Go therefore, Jesus said, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. So the church is an agent of proclamation, and the church is a new narrative. The church is saying, hey, there's another way to be human. There's a new way to live. There's a, Jesus has revealed to us something that we can sink our teeth and our hearts into. So go and make disciples. What's a disciple? A disciple is a pupil. Jesus is the master in the church. We're all sitting here this evening listening to a preacher, but we're not. I'm dependent on his word for a reason. Because the teacher, the master, is not the pastor, the evangelist. The master, we're not disciples of this church. We're not disciples of this preacher. We're disciples, we're disciples of Jesus we're his pupils. We're sitting at his feet. We're listening to him and what he has to say. And sometimes he speaks through a preacher. Sometimes he speaks through a donkey, according to scripture. He speaks through rocks if he wants to. But we're listening for his voice. Then Peter said to them, preaching the gospel, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you will receive the Holy Spirit. So as the gospel is preached, there's the invitation to be baptized. The word baptized means to immerse. To immerse in what? To immerse in the love of God. To immerse in the forgiving mercy of the Savior. To immerse in the new narrative, the new life, the Zoe life that is on display in Christ. Baptism isn't merely a ritual. It symbolically represents the human being. When I was baptized, I remember it. It was so cool. It was March of 1982. My wife Sue and I, we were baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We went under the water, and as I was just for a split second under the water, I remembered the word that I heard the preacher say, immersion. 
just whew, I'm just under the water. And in the process of going under the water, according to Scripture, I am moving through a symbolic gesture of identification with the death, burial, and then come out of the resurrection of Christ. So I'm just, I'm just identifying with a history, with a narrative. I'm saying I'm a fallen, broken, messed up, dysfunctional human being that has come from my first parents, Adam and Eve. But there's a new Adam. There's a new man. There's a new human. And his name is Jesus, and he has rewritten the script. There's a new narrative. And so I, by bap being baptized, I am saying yes to that new narrative, death, burial, resurrection, into newness of Zoe life the life of receiving and giving love. When I fail to receive and give love, I repent. He forgives me, and then I resume giving and receiving love. And if I fail you in the body of Christ, you come to me and you say, you really hurt me, Ty, when you spoke to me the way that you did or when you did what you did the other day. And I, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, am open to what hurt you. And I say, you know what? I'm like that sometimes, and I'm really sorry. Will you forgive me? And you say, yes, I forgive you. And then we continue in koinonia together, and we're better for it. We're better as human beings by living within that beautiful narrative. When I saw that woman against that wall, and she told me, she hadn't been touched in 12 years. I felt a stab of pain in my heart. I thought, how could it be that a human being could be that isolated and that alone? And the moment we surrounded her with some koinonia, with some fellowship, her joy was full. She began to live again. She began to turn back time even. She apparently became younger by all accounts. She stood up straighter. She took better care of herself. She got motivated to start exercising, for crying out loud, in her 80s. She told me, I'm going to walk and walk and walk and walk. Why? What are you so motivated about? <gasps> she just was so excited now because she was loved. There was motivation because she was loved. And she opened like a flower to the sun. You are invited whoever you are, I don't know all of you, I only know a few of you, but you're invited to be a part of this church. The Franktown Seventh-day Adventist Church um, is not a perfect church, but it is striving to be koinonia. The Franktown Seventh-day Adventist Church exists in this community um, to invite people in with open arms and to be a place that you can come and fellowship and to heal and to learn and to grow. So this is an official invitation for you to come to this church, to come here to be a part of this church in this community. And I guarantee you that you will experience great things. It's not that you won't experience some, some offense, some hurt, some hypocrites, some gossips, but you'll forgive them and they'll forgive you and you'll grow together and it'll be beautiful and wonderful and it's way better than staying home channel surfing. It's risky, but you're invited here. The Franktown Church gave me the permission to invite you. They want you here. You are welcome at the Franktown Seventh-day Adventist Church. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we want to thank you tonight for your word. We want to ask you to heal us of the wounds that we carry. I pray for every person here, Lord, whoever they are, whatever they've endured, whatever they've been through, whatever the chaos, the insanity of their lives, whatever the loneliness, whatever the isolation. Father, speak to each heart right now and draw them to you, draw them to your body, draw them into the fellowship of those who believe in the marvelous love that you have manifested toward, toward us in Jesus. 
Father, we open ourselves up to you tonight, and we just want to say yes and invite you in. In Jesus' name, amen. It's good to get together and worship, isn't it? And to be encouraged, as Ty was saying, and to be a part of a fellowship of believers. And um, on behalf of Godfrey, Pastor Godfrey Miranda and myself, we both really enjoy getting together with groups on Saturday mornings, on Sabbath mornings, and studying together, both here at this church, at the Franktown Church, and at the Castle Rock Church. The Castle Rock Church meets at the biggest building in Castle Rock. It meets at the Castle Rock Hospital right there. It's hard to miss in Castle Rock. And every Sabbath morning, there's a group that meets there to study. Just like here, there's a group that meets here to study. And one of the things that we as pastors love to do is to get together with you and worship together our, our God. And so each one of you are invited, whether, whether you're here in this area, or whether you're over in Castle Rock or a little bit farther down in Monument or up in Littleton, um, consider an open invitation from both of us to visit either this church or the Castle Rock Church. We would love to have you come and worship with us um, some Saturday morning, some Sabbath morning, and uh, get to know you a little bit better. You might have noticed last night that we finished a little bit of a different way, and I could see some expectant faces as we ended. And so I have, we are making up for it a little bit tonight. We have a few extra things that we would like to gift you with uh, this evening. And so, Godfrey, if we're going to do two at a time, we have two of the books from Ty Gibson, A God Named Desire. We have two complete DVD sets from last year's series with David Ashrick and Ty Gibson together. And then we have two Nathan Green pictures. Um, one of them is a picture, a beautiful picture of the second coming of Jesus, which uh, when I look at that gives me a lot of hope and a better day coming. And then the other picture is a picture of uh, Jesus. If anybody has ever seen the, uh, the television show It Is Written, you'll, you've seen this picture as well. It's a beautiful uh, picture of Jesus. So, Godfrey, um, let's do the books first. The two books, A God Named a Desire by Ty Gibson. Charlene Kinney and Esperanza Perez. Charlene, the Charlene's there, all right. And I think Esperanza was visiting from Florida, wasn't she? And she headed home today. Um, we'll go one more. Richard Cantor, right there in the front row. Very good. Enjoy the book. Hope those are a blessing to you. The next ones are A New World Coming by Ty Gibson and David Asherick. I believe there are 22, or is it 22 hours worth of, I think it's 22 hours worth of good, deep Bible study. And... Um, <laughs> Ty says that's because David is long-winded. One is Giselle and Hernan Block, and I believe they're here. There they are. Uh, Giselle and Hernan, you get uh, one of these. And then also David Graham. I saw David. Very good. Enjoy those DVDs. Those are great Bible studies. We need two more of them, Godfrey. Steiner, Meyer, Meyer, Steiner, all right, we have one, and then we also have Sean Romrell, is Sean here? Sean's not here tonight, let's, let's do one more, let's, let's give Steiner, Julie Pope, all right, very good, hope those are a blessing to you and an inspiration as you look at those and uh, think of your creator. Once again, just want to remind you that um, tomorrow there will be a Bible study in this uh, room here at 10 o'clock, and there will also be uh, another, the last two sessions with Ty will be at 11.15 here, and then we will have a meal that you're all invited to in our fellowship hall right across the hall, and then at 2 o'clock in the afternoon we will have our final session here with Ty. And uh, so you are all invited to uh, come back tomorrow. We'll see you then. God bless each one of you. Have a safe trip home and good night.